first Color of Light live event at the Mercury Gallery in Rockport. I'm Heather Atwood. I'm a producer at 1623 Studios, and I produce the Color of Light. In the Color of Light, I try to highlight artists who have been part of making the Cape Ann Art Colony serious and vital. Some of the artists I've covered have just summered here. Some of them have lived here full time. They Almost all of them have national significance with part of their work always including a little bit of Cape Ann. Telling these stories about these artists and showing their work is an important way to remind people really just how special Cape Ann is. So I want to thank the Mercurial Gallery and Amnon Goldman, the director here, for introducing me to Joseph Salman, the artist we're talking about today, and for hosting this event. And he also introduced me to Paul Salman, the son of the artist, and Ronnie Salman is here, his, the artist's daughter, also today. So thank you guys for being here. I really appreciate it. And Paul, I really appreciate all the work you did with me, you, the collaboration, I feel, on the video. Well, you did a great job. I mean, <laughs> as you know, the, I, I've sent this to a variety of people, you know, hey, this people who know, knew my father and know his work and stuff. And without exception, how many have I sent you? I, I've sent, I've forwarded her the emails and they were all like, Truly there wowed many, by yeah. it. Yeah, no, it's, it's Those really are the, the, the floods of emails I really enjoyed opening. As yeah, opposed I can, well, to, I would imagine. <laughs> no kidding. <laughs> <laughs> what a shock. Yeah, and Ronnie, <laughs> it's so lovely to have you here today, the, art, the daughter of the artist. And I particularly love the fact that you are arriving from that little cottage that we saw in the video where Joseph Salmon was producing his monotypes. So you inherited the cottage and you continue to come here, right? <clears throat> yes, I live in Los Angeles during the rest of the year, but every summer I come and <clears throat> summer in Cape Ann and I love it. Well, so I have a bunch of questions for the two of you, but I'm going to start with you, Ronnie. So your father, I mean, was a serious artist of the highest order. I, no one can contest that he was, he took art professionally and artistically. It was a very serious career. But he was also a father and a husband. So do you feel, can, can you see any way in which being a father affected his career? I mean, when I look back, what I remember grow. <coughs> yeah, they, they can't hear you in back. So you have to really talk up, not just to the kid. Sorry. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, when my, uh, when I look back, what I remember most about my father is what a great dad he was. And he was a dad first and foremost. So how it affected his art, I'm not quite sure, but he was also a driven artist. Like if we went out to dinner, he was sketching people that he saw in the restaurant on a napkin. You know, he always had something to draw with, you know, in a pocket. And he was always drawing. He just hey, is there a piece of paper? Is there, oh, let me get a napkin. So he was always an artist, but he also was just a, a splendid, splendid father and uh, gave me and Paul all sorts of time, love, attention. We felt very, really bathed in love from our dad. And, and you also, you studied art a little bit in college, and then you said when dad took you out it was the best he was the best teacher you had right right yes i audited a a, 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 a life drawing class he taught at ccny city college in new york while i was at barnard college which wasn't far away so i would arrange my schedule so i could take his ccny drawing class i took art classes even at columbia no one, no one held a candle to my dad. He, he, the way he taught, he was a really strict draftsman. And he'd look at your picture. He didn't believe that you, a student, could, was, your paper was inviolate. He just drew right on your paper to correct <laughs> how he said, no, look, the arm goes this way. You say, I think that is really against the rules as an art teacher, actually. <laughs> you probably, it's just, well, well yeah. all the rules yeah. have changed, but that's but what he, he did. Do you, do you have any sense that uh, he was limited as an artist because he was busy with his family. You know, he wasn't going to the parties. He wasn't networking. All those things that. Um, no, I, I didn't think it held him back at all. So mm -hmm. my mother was extremely good at hosting all the parties, making sure all the right people and collectors, potential collectors, came, and at the same time, introducing them to us. 
We yeah. were part of it. Yeah. Family was part of it. That's very interesting that your mother was like basically the the business person and the the a person bit, who a needed bit. to be. I mean, my yeah. dad was also a great promoter. He wasn't like some artists, many artists who have a hard time promoting their art or making money. He knew how to promote his art. He had no problem with his ego. He thought he was a very, very excellent artist, and he <laughs> he let everybody know. But uh, my mother greased the wheels. Definitely helped. Yeah, she she went to. She went to NYU. She got. She graduated from NYU in 1931, which is damn early for a woman, particularly somebody who'd come from Russia when she was 14 or 15. Uh, but she devoted her career to Joe, and uh, and was you know behind him as a rock and doing what Ronnie said from the get-go. One thing about him as a family man. And Ronnie's completely right. There was no crowding out of his art by us. He'd paint us all the time. You, there were two, <laughs> these two pictures of Ronnie in the, that girl lying down. That's Ronnie in that oh, in your video. Oh, that's a painting, yeah. Uh, but he, but he was resentful of the image of the artist as neurotic. Even though I'm named after, I was told I'm named after Paul Gauguin, Paul Cezanne, and Paul Clay. <laughs> But Paul Clay was a perfectly normal guy. <laughs> Gauguin was a monster. And uh, Cezanne wasn't uh, extremely well-adjusted either. But, the, but he really was annoyed by that image, that the, that the artist had to be crazy or you know, flamboyant. Because he was not. He was, as Ronnie said, his ego was solid. He, he, he's had tremendous self-confidence in his self-presentation and and in his art and uh and never wavered although I, I don't know if you know the story one time in 1939 he uh, richard a friend of mine and i were at a uh, exhibition and my, my friend who's very neurotic said uh were do, were you ever depressed because joe was always so up and he said uh, yeah once I, I told you the story well, I, yeah. yeah he told He's, me the story uh, yeah, yeah. in 1939 so when he was 30 years old, and, and Richard, my friend Richard, was so excited, he said, he said, really? Uh, wh why? And he said, well, because I, all these other artists, every artist told me I was the, the best of, uh, of us all. This is at the very end of the tens, yeah. four yeah. years. Uh, and, but I didn't have, you know, a big mu museum show or anything. You know, I wa he wasn't that well known. And my friend Richard said, what did you do to to deal with it. He said, I did five self-portraits and got over it. <laughs> <laughs> so I want to get returned to the abstraction conversation. But first, I want to ask, I know that uh, your father was always going to museums, often taking you guys along, maybe always taking you guys along. <laughs> yes. uh, so who were the artists who he was looking to his entire life? Who, who was he consistently turning to? to you know, solve artistic problems and who were sort of you know, models for him. You want to answer that? No, I want you to answer that. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's uh, generous of you. Um, Paul, he was a huge fan of Paul Clay's. Um, do you, everybody know who Paul Clay is? Yes, every. And that uh, work is very different from his, which is interesting. Very different. Yeah. And no, he, his work is nothing like Paul, any of the five or so different periods of Paul Clay's work, no. Right. But but he he loved Paul Clay, collected Paul Clay. You have two Paul Clay yeah. drawings. I have a drawing, I mean that yeah. came down. We uh, he so he was he was a huge fan, but he but he had very eclectic taste, right? right. I mean he you know, he was influenced by Gauguin mm -hmm. uh, with the dark uh, black lines mm -hmm. outlining, you know, uh, figures or uh, and he which we would talk about. Um, and that's very important in your father's work, the black outlines, right? Yes, he was very influenced in the early days by Georges Rouault, the, mm -hmm. who had been started out as a stained glass maker and then was a French modern uh, uh, of the you know, 1920s, 30s, and 40s. Mm -hmm. um, and, and his work resembled, his early work the resembled, early work, yeah. a couple of things you had in the, in the video in the beginning look kind of like Rouault's. Um, but just... <clears throat> very, very eclectic, but not with regard to contempt with what became, as you point out in the video, or we both point out in the video, became part, became the orthodoxy of American art or the 
the, the reigning taste of American art. He didn't, he had little uh, sympathy for or appreciation of uh, that, yeah? So, so, except there were some, he also loved Egon Schiele and some of the German expressionists, so I remember that, very, very big. But also, he had a few, few abstractionists he admired. Or like oh do tell just, just a few right he there were some I mean I don't know admire but he he like he would say now this Kandinsky right uh, this Joan Greece you know uh, I like this one right so he did appreciate because he collected the uh, you know a, at least a reprodu uh, right a reproduction of uh, a, a, a Joan Greece that he put up in the Gloucester yes, that's right. yeah, the one so there the, were yeah. certain there were some things that well, were just you know that were abstract from a period that he felt warranted his respect and his admiration. He also had a thing about abstract, uh, <coughs> abstract painters and artists, I remember. He said, they've got to at least know how to draw. <laughs> <laughs> so if they had a background in life drawing and you could see like in their, you know, in their resume some early drawings that were like well done, then he was at least willing to consider whether their abstraction was any good. That's why, and that's why he thought Barnett Newman was a fake. Because he couldn't draw. I, I don't know if he could or not, but he, cert he was a, I think he was a critic who then became a painter and just starting doing the lines and you know the, um, and uh, he just thought he was, well, he thought he was a fraud, as I yeah. said. Yeah. yeah. So tell us more about that struggle, the struggle with this, that time in American art, um, the course of American art, when we were infatuated with abstraction. And how did your father get through it? You said he was never depressed, but were there artists he was looking at to sort of reinforce his commitment to subject matter? Was, uh, do you remember con dinner conversation about it? Actually, Paul, you told me a story of yeah. being in an art gallery. Oh, yeah. This was a there was a, uh, a Danish artist named Hans Moller, um, who was a good friend of the family and whose work Joe respected considerably. And then we went, you're right, we, we were taken to museums and art openings from the time we were the littlest kids. So that was just second nature. And so I was at an opening, now I was a teenager, uh, probably 16 or 17 or something like that. And we went to the opening of Hans Moller's show at some New York gallery. And Hans Moller had gone abstract. That is, these paintings were abstract paintings. And it's the only time I remember, I have to have been others, but it's the time I vividly remember Joe being, as I've told you, being genuinely uncomfortable. And he was, and he said, he was uncomfortable because he didn't know what to say to Hans Moller. Because he thought, <clears throat> he thought that Hans Moller, he didn't say this to me, but I thought that he thought that Hans Moller was selling out. And this has been a friend of his, so yeah. it was the, the discomfort came from what do I say to him when yes. I don't like he, this he, I can remember him kind of, you know, I may be making this up, but it's, you know, 60 years ago. But I, the way I picture it now, he's almost trying to avoid <laughs> you know, Hans Muller. I mean, yeah. that's probably all <laughs> embellished by my memory. But, but I remember being un, in, very uncomfortable because whoever saw him uncomfortable, right? Right, right. He okay. made us uncomfortable sometimes by, you know, yeah. recognizing actors in the street and saying hello. And, <laughs> you know, he because he he didn't care. You know, he was just. But uh, but he I almost never saw him uncomfortable. Right, right. You know how he he got. He got through <coughs> some of this, not through depression, but through anger. He wrote angry letters to the New York Times, yeah. uh, you know, in their art section about the phoniness of abstract expressionist art. Which, of course, they didn't publish. But uh, I mean, I think they, I think they well, are, they are, a couple they did. News, I think Art yeah. News published a couple. Yeah, it was one about Ar Barnett Newman. I should have thought to bring it. You would be, you would be amazed to see it. <laughs> the vituperation in this <laughs> denunciation of poor Barnett Newman. <laughs> well, and my father was really good. Our father was really good with words. Oh, he was terrific He wrote writer. poetry. He was really something else. So when he wrote a devastatingly negative uh, art critique of a, a whole genre, a popular genre of art, <laughs>
You know, I was so surprised when um, he and Edward Hopper and who was the third artist started Reality Well, Bible. I don't know. There, there's a whole bunch of them. I noticed that Milton Avery is the yes. first name on that. Yes, yeah, right. right. I hadn't noticed that before. But, but there are a whole bunch. Joe Martini. I saw a whole bunch of names of people I So it just struck knew. me. Hopper, Salmon, was there any sort of They worked together there? a little, but they, no, they were... No. He's much... Hopper he's was old. much Hopper older. Hopper was older. Yeah, right, he said, right. Okay. He, the story he told about Hopper at one of the meetings of Reality was the only story I ever heard about him, was he said Hopper would sit there just quietly and never say a word. And at the end, uh, and Joe was totally an autodidact because his parents were, you know, not, they were immigrants and my gran our grandfather barely spoke English. I mean, we didn't hardly ever saw him. And Joe was, uh, so so he and he left high school to go to the Art Students League. So he didn't, but he but he was a tremendous reader and a terrific writer. So Hopper is sitting there, and he he said he said he goes up to Hopper at the end of the uh, session, the meeting, and he says to him, "I bet you read Ralph Waldo Emerson." And Hopper, <laughs> according to Joe, says to him, "I read him every day." <laughs> <laughs> I think that's the extent of their. <laughs> Relationship. Yeah, everything, I think, actually. That's his his relationship to Jackson Pollock was similarly <laughs> short-lived. They were on the mural project together of the WPA in, I think, 1940, very briefly, and then they, Joe went to work for in the defense industry. The war had started, soon started. And he said Pollock and he went out to lunch. And Pollock, and they had a couple of beers, and Pollock said, I... Let's have another beer. And Joe went, mm, this, this guy yeah. is trouble. <laughs> and that was the end of their relationship. And that was when Pollock was completely figurative. He was doing these WPA girls, uh, right? 39, uh, yeah, yes, that's right. He would have, that's why he would have been, right. He doesn't start doing more, more. Abstraction. Well, right. abstraction, not until the later 40s. Right. But yeah, no, he's still, he's right. But I think he could draw that Pollock, so maybe. Uh, your father would yeah. have dismissed him totally. <clears throat> he, I think he dismissed him pretty totally. Yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> if I remember right. I, I, yeah. Rothko, he said he came to, to appreciate. There's oh. no question, by the way, that Rothko was influenced by him because if you look at their work in the 30s, Rothko's work is similar to, as was Adolf Gottlieb's, similar to what Joe had been doing. So mm -hmm. I, I don't think there's any Certainly the question. color is yeah. really relevant. Yeah, well, you don't know the extent to which, you know, Rothko's obsession with color came from Joe. That's yeah. So, to, <clears throat> but to that point, let's follow up a little bit on that, his relationship with Rothko, because he never dismissed Rothko. And what was going on there? What was he seeing in Rothko's, you know, um, <clears throat> mystical sorts of works? You have it? Well, I think that has something to do with his relationship with Rothko, yeah, yeah. because he and Rothko <coughs> founded the Ten, they co-directed the Ten, so I have a feeling there was a relationship there that kind of forgave Joe Rothko going abstract mm -hmm. and oh. seeing the cut and <coughs> able to look past the abstraction to the things that he that he could probably see his own work in, like the color and you know the combinations and the sensitivity and the texture thought well rothko's got a little bit of salm in there <laughs> that's that's how he would have been thinking about it, it it's true well, he, the, the two things i remember about him talking about rothko <clears throat> were one that rothko used to hit on our mother <laughs> and he was i don't know he, i don't think he was terribly resentful but he wasn't uh i don't think he loved him for that and then they split, <clears throat> the, that group split in 1939, and what Joe was, said was they split over the uh, Hitler-Stalin pact. Remember, these are all lefties, right? Jewish artists, almost all of them, I think only one of the ten was not Jewish. Um, and so they, they, were all, they were, I think, all I, the, uh, members of the Artists' Union, was, which was strongly left-wing, communist, uh, now you have the Hitler-Stalin pact, and do you go with Stalin, or do you go, do you say, hey, wait a second, you know, this is a bit much. Uh, and Rothko and Adolf Gottlieb, at least, went, this is a bit much, this is too much for us. 
and Joe and was stayed loyal, I think, because our mother was a loyal Communist Party member, right? Um, yeah, who knows? Well, yeah, I mean, sure. They, well, she didn't. They didn't tell yeah. us because that was all. You know, you weren't supposed to talk about it because it, of McCarthy and well, McCarthy's a little later, but even then, right, right. Uh, by the time we come along, it's McCarthy. Uh, so, so that that split happens, and uh, and it, and in some sense, and Joe certainly thought this, and there's plenty of scholarship to uh, substantiate this, that. That split of not uh, of figurative versus abstract was a split that was amplified by and supported by uh, the reigning powers of American Cold War. So Henry Luce, when I talk about the irascibles, that's part of a program of America expression, abstract expressionism from the inside as opposed to Soviet collectivism, which you have in, in your, your video. Uh, and I think Joe felt that very strongly. Uh, the other thing about Rothko was that Joe thought that he, that he was, very, he was uh, very conflicted about what he'd done and whether he'd reached a dead end uh, as those he was of you conflicted know. about what he had done personally. About no, what, what Rothko, Rothko had done, I'm sorry. Yeah. I, uh, and, you know, and Rothko's biography is a dead end. I remember Dad telling one story about having run into Rothko, this is in later years, so maybe the 60s or something, and Rothko says to him, Joe Salman. And Joe was really pissed off that Rothko was like, he thought, pretending to recognize him after they had yeah. known each other so intimately. But Rathka was always a very bitter, uh, unhappy guy. That drink, huge drinker killed, him, killed himself. And so uh, that was part of Joe. Joe didn't hang out with people like that, like his Pollock story would suggest. Yeah. Right, right. And it sounded as if Rothko, uh, you know, Joe continued to develop ideas, and we're going to get to the monotypes in just a second, and right up until his 90s. And Rothko did hit a dead end with those the blocks of color, right? Well, or an apotheosis. I mean, you know, yeah. if you're a Rothko fan and you go to that, you know, the Demeniel Chapel in Houston, and it's those dark ones at the very end of his life, there are people who go there to pray and to weep. I mean, so you, you know, if you're a Rothko fan, that's, it's the peak of his career. Well, let's talk about the monotype process, because that happened, I believe, on Cape Ann. Can you talk about what inspired that? Because that changed his work a lot, right? <coughs> Yeah, they <clears throat> they bought the cottage in 1967 for $11,000 at Good Harbor Beach. Uh, <laughs> it's never been remodeled. It's never been winterized. <laughs> it's adorable. <laughs> um, and he, I think, was reading up on, on some monotype stuff that Degas had done, and maybe <coughs> Paul Clay did monotype. A few. A few. Very, very few. Anyway, I think he was looking for a medium that he could do here that wouldn't involve all the big mm -hmm. easel and da 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 that he had in his New York studio. And like, the, <clears throat> like your show showed, uh, the light of Cape Ann may have also inspired, you know, he's always done drawings, my daddy did drawings, black on white paper and more sparse when it was, you know, Good Harbor Beach. And back in the day they used to have trash cans and garbage trucks. He loved drawing those and doing monetizing of those on the beach. So, uh, and motorcycles, right? And motorcycles yeah. on the beach. So anyway, he, uh, he started playing around with it in 1970, I think. And no, earlier, earlier. Maybe 69. Uh, oh, yeah, late, I think. Late 60s. Or 68. Yeah, that's 68, 68 is the first one Maybe I know. so that would be the second summer. He, well, actually, they did not spend the summer here in 67. No, they I bought it did, at I, the end of the summer, so right. it must have been 68 or 69 yes, was when he started. 68 was the first one that I know. And then in the 1970s, he, he did a little more, and then it just kept growing from there. Then he, he worked on a book. When did the book come out? 70s, mid-70s. Mid-70s, he did a book on both the process and with examples. Yeah, it's closer, it's closer to 1980, yeah. Yeah. So can you talk about the process itself and how light began to enter the, his work a lot more? 
Can you, no, you should talk to this. No, uh, Ronnie's no. the artist here, so. Oh, no, no. And you, you go, because you, you did that whole piece on it. At the well, that's the one that you saw. Uh, no, I, I, in the 60s, this is my take on it. Um, in the 60s, we, we lived on 10th Street and 2nd Avenue in Manhattan, which was a completely nondescript neighborhood when we moved in in 1952. Uh, it, it was uh, Polish and uh, Ukrainian immigrants, many of them from the Cold War. So, uh, and gradually, within a decade, uh, it became the East Village and the hippest place on earth, right? Uh, and all these people dressing flamboyantly and so forth. So that began to open up his palate. Uh, and then when he goes, comes here, of course he'd been, we'd been coming here since 1951 when we were little kids. Uh, but his paintings, as you saw, I think from, I mean, in your video, they're not the, the early pictures, the one you have of, uh, it was hard to see the here now. The cemetery up here. Yeah. What? And the, you know, the, the gazebo, the gazebo, yeah, the gazebo right. that's not playing with light. Right. Not at all. Yeah, no. I mean, By the way, they rented in the apartments right over here, right on Front Beach. Right, the so, Perry apartments, yeah, right, right, exactly. right, 75 yeah. Front Beach. Right. Yeah. And so he, I think it was the medium of mm. uh, monotypes that then it invites you to do it all on white paper, but it's paintings. And you saw how he's doing it. He, he puts a piece of glass over a drawing, and then he's, he, uh, in, in the one we saw, he's putting the paint on the glass, and then he's tracing the drawing with, as you saw, a Q-tip there. He had a lot of Q-tips. And, and lobster forks. He used the back of lobster. The, the end of the lobster fork had a little knob on it, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then he used that to trace. <laughs> right. Or he would be painting using the drawing as a template. So he'd do it either as a negative picture or as a you know, positive in, in that sense. Uh, but it's all on white, pa it's paintings on white paper. Mm -hmm. And he's really using the white of the page. Yeah, and then the you naturally, time, yeah, hardly the yeah. first yeah, artist hardly. to do that, but yeah. you, yes. But in his work, that it's well, it just as I said, said yeah. to you, it, it did open it up, and and when you look at the monotypes, there's one in there. Uh, uh, the they're they're much more they're luminous from the paper as opposed to. Some of the interiors, there's an interior in there as well from the breath in early 1950s with the, with the windows in which the way he's playing with light is through the windows. Mm. And that's that lustrous quality right. of light that Kimmelman talks about and you talk about in the, in the video. Uh, but that's very different, very different than the you know, light coming through, right? He, he never felt comfortable doing watercolors, which is a medium I work in, but when he started doing monotypes, it had a quality of watercolor. Yeah. The result was like the quality of watercolor, which really made him feel good about it. I mean, he, and he also got a lot of support. I mean, a lot of people really admired him, and it came out looking so beautiful. People would say, oh, that's great. And he thought, it is kind of great. Let me keep doing this. So when you were here in Cape Ann, uh, was there a sense of connecting with any art community here or were you here as a family vacationing and your father happened to make art more like the latter but he did didn't he i don't know if he joined the rockport art association but he dealt with them and sometimes he was a little more connected to the art community here and sometimes a little less but once the mercury gallery opened then he became you know mm -hmm. part of part of main street but he, but he he felt about the art community here that it was that it you know that it was bearskin neck, you know, and it was playing to the tourists who want pictures of uh, waves or uh, motif right. number one. I mean, but there were some serious artists in Glasgow. No, no, I, I'm, sure. not, I'm, yeah, I'm talking about what he thought. Yeah, I'm, okay. I'm not, <laughs> I'm not, <laughs> not making your yeah. No, no, <laughs> no. And it, no, so he did not. Connect. He he liked he he loved the work of the uh, woodcut artist Al Serapak. Uh, so there were there were artists here whom he admired. And Na Na Napoleon Setti, the stained glass maker who lived on up on Mill 
Mill Lane, I think. Yeah, so there were some. There were and some. some had come from New York. And of course, they came here initially because it was known, had been known as an art community. Mm -hmm. So I, he would have he would have loved being uh, friendly with. I mean, he was friendly with Milt Avery, but Milt Avery is older, and so Milt Avery wasn't summering here anymore when you know when my parents were. But if he could go back in time, you know, and see some of uh, what was, the, what was the name of the French artist that summered here? I mean, Hopper p summered here, but uh, anyway, <coughs> there were different famous artists that summered in. I mean that. He's either summered or lived here for a period of time. But he wasn't going out painting with them or... No, no. although, uh, well, I don't know if any of you know Dennis Flavin. He was a bit of an entrepreneur yes, in... Yes, uh, the in, in the restaurant, Flaves? Uh, he, uh, oh, he, no, he has Halibut's he, Point. He had Halibut's Point, but he sold it. Which is now Blackburn it. Tavern. Uh, yes, and yeah. he sold it. But Dennis Flavin is an artist on Cape Ann, much younger than my dad, was a protege of my dad's. And they went drawing and painting together, yes. Oh, that is so And Dennis Flavin did an ama amazing portrait of my dad that sits on my porch, and it's like having him with me. Oh, wow. Well, that's very exciting, because I've seen some of Flavin's pictures in... Flavin is quite an artist. Yeah. Quite an artist. Oh, he's also a pretty good restaurant guy. <laughs> right. so, uh, so before we open it up to questions, is there anything you would like to add that um, we're missing here about your father? No, he, he, did, he had really... He lived the life he resented as being portrayed as not the life of an artist, <laughs> if that sentence makes sense. I mean, he, he had a great time. He loved us madly. He loved his wife madly. He loved other people madly. He, uh, but he was judicious. Uh, he wasn't, you know, uh, wasn't a glad hander, certainly, anything but that. He loved... Proust. He loved Emily Dickinson. He wrote a, an Emily Dickinson-like poem that's, that was pretty much like Emily Dickinson. It was kind of amazing. <laughs> he loved Blake. He loved Chekhov. He loved Mozart. He just completely adored. He, and, he, and he was eclectic enough that I, I, my first wife, Judy, is here, and we were huge fans, and that's why they bought the house in, in Gloucester, to be near us. And uh, we were huge and remain huge fans of rhythm and blues. And it was my father who told me one day in the early, but probably 1963 or something, he said, you know, there's a guy you're really going to like, Otis Redding. <laughs> and we, we actually saw Otis Redding at the Apollo Theater a few years later. But so my father turned me on to Otis Redding. I mean, it was just, that's the kind, kind of he was paying attention. breadth of appreciation that he had and he he lives till he's 99 I took him to Europe twice in when he was 91 and 92 years old which is which I recommend to anybody it doesn't look like this crowd could probably do that but because when you go to with well no I'm saying if you know if your parent is 92 and you go to Europe and you, you're in Italy and you say and it's too late you know or they won't that you can't stay in the Giotto Chapel or something. I'd, I knew enough Italian to go, il mio padre, 93 anni. It was 93, actually. 93 anni. Oh, complimenti, complimenti. <laughs> <laughs> and, and you get another wheeling around. Through. So, and he just, that's what he said. I said, Dad, can you believe we're in Europe and we're driving around and going? And he said, you're 93 years old. It's crazy, it's crazy. But he loved it, and he did it to the last day of his life. He, he was singing. The guy who we had taking care of him was pushing him down uh, Fifth Avenue on a beautiful April day in New York, and he was Joe was in a wheelchair by then, and Robert describes him as going like this and singing to the <laughs> buildings he'd been painting since the 19 late 1920s. What was he singing? Do we know? Yeah, I, I, <laughs> <laughs> ah, I noticed Redding aficionado. <laughs> <laughs> How about you, Ronnie? Well, it's just like Paul said. I mean, he, I, I happen to be uh, somebody that in my retirement from teaching, <coughs> I, I fight for uh, racial and social justice. And it was my dad, when I was uh, just graduated from college, saying, you know, 
could you find, I was staying at my mom and dad's briefly before I moved to California. And he said, can you look something up in the phone book and find a, there must be an, a group that's raising money for legal defense for the Black Panther Party. This is terrible. They're getting arrested all over the country. So can you look it up? Because I want to donate art to an art, an art show for their, to raise money for their legal defense. And sure enough, and it set me in a, in a path. That's wonderful. That's really wonderful. Well, so thank you very much for listening to this. But <laughs> and we, I'm sure you have questions because these two are so great at answering them. <laughs> so, but yes. give you need the mic. Yeah, right. All right. We right. have to do that. So, Emily, shall I give this to you? So, if you have a question, raise your hand, and Emily will give you the mic. This gentleman right here seems to be ready. And, if, and when you answer. Oh, this is so, sort of a double question. Um, you can speak what, up, though, because they can't what, hear you. What did, he, what, did he, what did your father think I'll, of, I'll repeat it, right? of um, artists that took real objects and called them art, like Duchamp? And along that line, what did he think about um, artists that became even more commercial, like, like Warhol? Yeah, he, what did he think of artists who use real objects like Duchamp uh, or artists who became even more commercial, like uh, Warhol? Uh, I, I think he, he had... I can't remember talking to him much about uh, Warhol or Lichtenstein or... Uh, he liked Rauschenberg. He liked Rauschenberg's work. He thought a lot of them. I think he actually contacted Rauschenberg. I think he told me he tried to contact Rauschenberg once to Robert Rauschenberg to, uh, to, do, to do something together. So but it was shocking to me because I, I, don't, I don't get Rauschenberg, but, uh, but, he, but he did. And I, I, he may have been, you know, bending over backwards a little bit to find somebody in that. But I don't think he had any use for Lichtenstein, Warhol, no. uh, the whole, no. you know, uh, 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 op, op art, pop art. I'm a conceptual. I yeah, mean, to, really conceptual. but op art and pop art to him were just another commercialization of what what people were calling art, and he thought it was just uh, playing. Playing to the money and playing to the to the crowd, and and he and he didn't have much respect for what he called commercial artists. Uh, I thought he was, in fact, I mean, my own personal view, it was he was too dismissive of that. Uh, of uh, yes, yes, he was. I will say that we were both influenced growing up that there was fine art, and then there was commercial art. Yes, right. And really, that's ridiculous. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. He was he was a hardliner. <laughs> yeah. He, yes. line of that, but, but he was a bit of a Stalinist on certain issues. <laughs> <laughs> well, true to form. Uh, maybe once a Stalin. Yeah, we, we, I, asked, I asked my mother in the 80s, our mother in the 80s, I said, well, what about Stalin? She said, well, <laughs> 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 yeah, yeah, well he yeah. made a few mistakes. <laughs> yeah, 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 you know, what, what can you do? You know? Anyone else with a question? He, he liked, uh, but he thought Duchamp was, was a clever gimmick. Uh, I remember there's a Picasso of handlebars, I think that he thought was also, you know, it's an antelope, but it's just handlebars, that he thought was very clever, but not, that's not what you do with, for your, for your career. Yeah, there's. Thank you so much for this, it's just, I, I love, I love your father's paintings, and it's great to, to hear from you. Um, some of my favorites are his uh, landscapes of, of New York City. And I wondered if you could share some more about his life in the city, his relationship to the city um, during all those decades when there was so much change. And uh, just maybe to give us some context for the, the paintings that are so rich uh, on that subject. So you want to bring that back so Ronnie can... He was <clears throat> a total New Yorker. He loved wow. New York. He, he, uh, he loved everything about it. And uh, he was just, he appreciated walking in it. He appreciated bus rides. He, uh, I wouldn't say, he wasn't crazy about the subway. He obviously used it. But he loved all, uh, all of Manhattan. He didn't have much use for the other boroughs. <laughs> <laughs> no, you gotta understand. You gotta understand that when growing up in Manhattan, you you to go to Brooklyn was already 
you know, Brooklyn was what, I don't know, Montreal or something like that. <laughs> and Far Rockaway was Moldova. It was like, you know, you just, we were so insular, you know, that cover from the New Yorker of, uh, you know, New York and then everything else is, is completely alien. Yeah. And, and that's, that was our upbringing, right? Right. And um, but it, was, it, was, it was very cool to, to grow up in New York with my dad and, and our dad and our mom as parents. But they were absolute inveterate New Yorkers and you just felt like you were in the center of the universe. So how about, um, as I'm going to follow up on your question, as the city changed, and because it sure did, between the 30s, well, he was born in Queens, right? Yeah, you, you, he was born in, no, he was born, well, he was born in uh, Belarus, uh, in Vitebsk, where Mark Chagall was, was born. Uh, quickly, he, 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 once ran, he once ran into Mark Chagall at a gallery, and, and he, he tried to speak in French, and Joe's French was <laughs> truly sucked. <laughs> and so, and he, and then he left, and then he, he, then he told this story for years afterwards. He said, "Why didn't I speak to him in Yiddish?" <laughs> <laughs> so, because they were from the same, the same town in, in same Belarus. Schedule. What? Yeah, yeah. Well, I don't know. If it, yeah. So, so it was, it was a pretty New Yiddish York, town. Excuse me. Watching New York over the years, and uh, can you reflect on what he was watching and feeling in those years? What he was seeing, what he liked, what he didn't like. My dad, our dad was like really adaptable. And so he totally adapted to the new scene. It, when it was an immigrant kind of ghettoish, ghettoish area, when it became a hip, you know, uh, East Village, then it went through a kind of a depression in the uh, late 60s, I think from a lot of uh, drug, uh, drug <coughs> overdose, or drug abuse in the area. And uh, then it rebounded again as a very fashionable downtown, you know, destination for good restaurants and stuff. Oh, he was wheeling our mom with a wheelchair every night to a different restaurant. Now he was doing well. There was Mercury Gallery. He was in both Rockport and in Boston selling art of his. He was making more money than he'd ever made before. He lived it up. And it's like that all came to him in his neighborhood that he lived in for over 50 years. Yeah, he was... He <laughs> He, and he, lo he loved the city. And you saw it, I mean, you have it in your video where you have these, you know, dark paintings of New York and then you have these graffiti, you know, yeah. that, that one in yeah. particular of, you know, this, these walls with graffiti and he thought they were fabulous. Yeah, there's a piece inside yes. that, yeah. with the graffiti on it. And he, he, it's look, it appears as if he saw the graffiti as drawing, just more drawing. <laughs> yeah, and, and, he, and he did become really, really interested in that period you're talking about where Originally, he's doing the facades of buildings, right, and the uh, signs. He loved the signs with the hands and stuff like that. That's the 30s. By the end, he's doing the negative shapes of the skyline defined by the buildings, right? So it's a kind of a total reversal, and yet it's the same, same city in some sense. But, of course, it's the skyscrapers that are now defining the city and defining those shape so he would go on to 57th street and look down the street to god knows what he'd do now with those spindle residence oh. towers and the negative spaces seem to be important in those skies oh, and they buildings, always right? and they yeah. always were if you look at his earliest work you can see and he would point that out to us look at how i would look at how i've created a shape here you know under the arm something like that. The portrait inside is particularly beautiful. I noticed like so negative spaces with the arm and the chest. And yeah, it's he, really he, he was, you know, master. a designer and a colorist and a great draftsman. And, you know, he, he pretty much had the whole package. We have another question? Yeah, over there. I have a more personal and base question. Base? Base. As in B-A-S-S -S or B-A-S-E? B-A-S-E. Oh, okay. I'm always full of base questions. My uh, wife always says that about me. So um, for many years, my wife has had a discussion about whether I could buy a motorcycle. And she's always said to me, it's too dangerous. Yes. You can't own a motorcycle. She's right. I, uh, yes, I, I, you know, it took me 40 years to realize she was right. <laughs> so we had a lot of mono monotypes that oh, Amnon cool. was helping helped us to buy and that we bought. And then one day I walked into the gallery and this is another discussion we always had. Can I buy another piece of artwork? And she said, we have many pieces of artwork. All our walls are covered. 
And then I walked in here and I saw one of a motorcycle. <laughs> and I came home and I said, I'm going to buy a motorcycle. <laughs> and she said, no, you can't buy that. I said, come to the gallery, and she looked at it, she said, you can buy it. So now it hangs in one of our rooms when I go buy it almost every day, and it satisfies some of my libidinal desires, but not all of this. So did Joe love motorcycles as much as I did? Did he ride one? Did you ride one? Never. I, I, rode, I rode on one once, I think. I, 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 was, uh, I was on a, yes, yeah, speaking of, it's cute. Look at that. Yes, I can hear it. Yeah. I arranged that to come, come in. around again. It made me happy, yes. That's, man, that's like... He never I, liked most motorcycles, but he did a lovely work with a number of motorcycles. Well, he, no, he never drove, he never rode a motorcycle. I don't remember him ever having the slightest interest in motor, uh, riding a motorcycle. We didn't even have a car. And they, they drove across the country in the 30s. One of his, uh, he was on the w Workers' Progress Administration, the WPA, and they sent him to Spokane, Washington. And the way they got there was by driving what he called a fliver, uh, you know, kind of a jalopy that, uh, that, that I think broke down in the middle of the desert and stuff. But no, we didn't even have a car growing up. Uh, so no, no interest, but... No, no, I, I think I was on a motorcycle once that I can remember with a friend, you know, in high school, and we drove up. This could be a false memory, but I don't think so. We drove up to the house, and Joe had just come back from a uh, auction because his, his money burned a hole in his pocket. He would just collect art, and we, we had a fantastic collection. He had a Degas mo monotype that now hangs at the Metropolitan Museum. So he would just scrounge money, trade, uh, trade up. We had all really amazing stuff in the house as well as these Paul Clay drawings I was talking about earlier and I came up on a motorcycle and I don't remember him being nonplussed by it he was showing off a Daumier drawing he had just bid at <laughs> one at, at Park Bernay galleries that's how that's at least how I remember it. And, and I rode a motorcycle once in Madison Wisconsin where I went to college for a year and uh, it was very exciting, like in the winter, and I rode on the back seat of it. And I did have a fantasy that maybe someday I would have a motorcycle. There. But I, too, didn't even learn how to drive until I moved to California. So, and then now the idea of owning or having my children on a motorcycle is terrifying, actually. Yeah. But he liked the shapes. And, oh, and I wanted to say about negative shapes, he talked a lot about negative space in paintings. He did, I remember that expression that you know, that phrase, negative space, and in the, you know, in, in his drawing class, negative space. There is one, there's one aspect of his life that we haven't talked about, and it's the, the darkest aspect, which is uh, we had, well, Roddy wasn't born yet, but I was just a couple weeks old, and we, there was a, uh, another sister, and she was going to be three years old, and she's in one of the pictures in your video, uh, there, uh, you see a woman who's attending to a little kid. I don't know if you remember that picture. That was Wendy, and she was hit and killed instantaneously by a milk truck when we lived in Hartford when he was working in the defense industry. And then they moved us back to New York, they moved me back to New York, and then Ronnie was born a couple of years later and was sort of the reincarnation uh, of Wendy. And then, but there were those couple of years, and Abnon told a story that, that you, t correct me if I'm wrong here, but it, it, Joe once said to you that after Wendy died, he didn't care if he got hit by a truck for the next two years, right? And then he decided to be a happy person. And then what? After Ronnie was born, he said he decided to be a happy person. And I after know. Ronnie, he yeah. said, after that? Ronnie was born, he decided to be a happy person. So and we're all happy. We're all happy people knowing <laughs> Ronnie. <That's laughs> so he just made that decision. He was so well, dark. Well, I think she was. We've got the daughter again, and so. Right. Um, but, and how about your your mother? How? Um... <clears throat> well, apparently this whole, you know, that was a great tragedy in the family, obviously, and she was Wendy was the first grandchild in my mother's family as well. <clears throat> but I interestingly, my mother was also a great uh, student of Freud, and when I we learned about our older sister's death kind of years down the road uh, because nobody wanted to talk about it because it was a deep, dark, sad secret. I was 10 and Ronnie was seven and a half. 
But my mother believed what Freud would say, which is you don't have to tell the kids anything until they ask. And because of a teasing situation where Paul was telling me that a photograph in our grandparents' apartment wasn't me and him, it was our sister, just inventing it. I, I, we never had a sister, so I'd come running out into the living room of where my par our parents are and our grandparents, and I said, we never, I never had a sister, right? We never had a sister. Silence. But that was a question. Demanded an answer. Oh, yeah, that's the, right. This is the one that's in, in Heather's painting, and that's our mother with Wendy. So <clears throat> a few years after learning about oh. Wendy's existence and demise, you know, we would include her in all our games, you know, have a seat for Wendy and stuff. But all these pictures and photographs were hidden away. We came upon them years later. Oh. Uh, but I asked my mother, we were going <clears throat> somewhere together on the bus, I remember, and I said, Mom, did I replace Wendy? Hoping for a positive response. <laughs> but mother thought, you never tell a child that she's replaced another child, right? Oh, no, you're, I started weeping. I was so <laughs> disappointed. Oh, no, of course you replaced me. <laughs> as in, and as indeed you were. Yeah. And indeed I did. Yeah. This is such a good yeah, so this would be 19, is so Wendy's, so what, one, one and a half? So this is 1942, let's say, 1943, something like that. So they're back, they're in, yeah, they're, they're, I think they're not yet in Hartford, or maybe, maybe he's already, they're already in Connecticut, yeah. Coming from a similar political Back, background, um, parents, same, sorry, yeah, <laughs> um, did your father's politics influence his art? Did my father, did our father's in politics influence his, uh, his art? I don't think so. I don't think so. He, he didn't, he didn't have much patience for things like social realism. He respected them, and of course he had fellow artists who did that in the WPA. He respected it, and it was great to celebrate the worker, and da 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 da. But objectively looking at it, he wasn't that into it as a work of art. No, no, he wasn't. There's one interesting thing. In, in, in 1939, I guess, when he was a member of the Artists' Union, and they put out a magazine, which is online and you can see, which is very interesting, for which he wrote, called Art Front Magazine. And Art Front Magazine, and the editor had been Stuart Davis, who was an abstractionist, uh, whose work Joe very much admired. Uh, but in Art Front Magazine, there was a cartoon by a guy we knew, Phil Bard, a painter, who, and Joe did a wonderful portrait of him. Uh, and it was a, it's a, and you can see this online too, uh, of Don Quixote tilting not at a windmill, but at an abstract painting. <laughs> and Joe, so 1939, Joe, Joe, one of the first things he wrote for the for Art Front magazine was an appreciation of Giorgio de Chirico, the surrealist, Italian surrealist. And Joe organized a petition at this meeting, or in, a, in a, uh, advance of this meeting, saying that Art Front was not taking a position against abstraction, much as the you know, manifesto of reality in the early 50s says. You know, with all styles, no, no orthodoxy. No orthodoxy. One of the members of the 10 was a Mondrian fan Ilya Bolotovsky, who did pure abstractions, pure abstractions, not a, not a figurative moment in it, but he was part of that group and, and they, they had accepted him in it. Uh, and Joe circulated the petition and at that meeting, as the story he's told goes, and I believe it's been verified, although I, I've, anyway, the his name was put into nomination as one of the new editors of Art Front. He'd already written for it, so people obviously knew he was very capable uh, and literate. 
And he was made, I think it's the editor, the triumvirate of editors that followed Stuart Davis. And it was Harold Rosenberg, who became one of the two great champions of abstract expressionism, but wasn't at the time. Uh, Meyer Shapiro, who became a famous art historian, and Joe. That's interesting. How did that, does that relationship continue? No, I, we never I met. Can't, yeah, I can't and, he, and, he, and he was utterly dismissive of Harold Rosenberg and particularly Clement Greenberg's, uh, you know, uh, infatuation with and promotion of abstract expressions. I think one more question, and until people, yeah, unless people are I, dying, for divorce question. So one more. Wait. Did your father ever express yeah. an opinion or any observation Say, on? Louder. Did your father ever express an opinion or any observations uh, with respect to Soviet sponsorship of social realism, almost to the exclusion of everything else within the USSR? I don't remember him, but I'm sure if he, if asked, he would have thought that that was uh, not okay. He certainly didn't take the Marxist position on art which is that it had to have a social function. I don't know if we have it here, but there was a, a uh, review in the Daily Worker, the communist daily newspaper, the American uh, Communist Party daily newspaper, by, by an artist, fellow artist, Jack, Jack Kanan, who became an abstractionist and part of the color school in Washington, D.C. many years later. I think Joe thought he probably sold out. But, uh, but Kanan's review and we had it when the Mercury Gallery in Boston ran a show, uh, uh, Whitney's Dissenter 60th anniversary show that we ran. Uh, we had published a catalog at the back of which is this little review and Jacob Kanan says how this is, you know, the, the work of the 10 is really good or something like that. I can't quote it, but, but it, it would be good if they had a little more social value in their work. Uh, so, and Joe would never have, never have bought that. Well, on that note, wait, am I interrupting Ronnie? Do you have no. a comment? Okay. No. Well, I want to thank both of you for being here. Ronnie oh, Solomon please. and Joseph Paul okay. Solomon. <laughs> and thank you all for coming, really. Yeah. really. And thank you all for being here and being here. It's been a pleasure. Yeah. It, 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 I so. thought it was going to be a little discussion of Joe. It became, this is your life. <laughs> <laughs> It's such an interesting life, right? Yeah. yeah so you brought value to all of ours. Thank you so much. And again, thanks for being here. Thank you.